Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper and today I'd like to tell you the story of this brilliant painting by Gustav Klimt. He made it early in the 20th century, probably in 1901, and you can find it in the, uh, in the Upper Belvedere in, uh, in Vienna. It is world famous, and of course Klimt is world famous, for his, his very peculiar style. Uh, this, this strange sort of combination of using very figurative ways of painting and then adding all this gold that lacks depth and, and the whole thing becomes a strange picture to look at. And it was extraordinarily modern for his time. He was part of various movements that combined, you might say, are the new art movements of his time. In, in German that would be Jugendstil, in, in French you would call it Art Nouveau. But he managed to combine all kinds of new elements with very, very old ones, because what we see here is a very traditional subject in art. There are quite traditional elements within the way he portrayed it. It is a biblical story, and it, he, he painted it within this frame that is, well, gilded as well, and contains the title at the top. And the fact that that frame and the painting seem to be one entire work of art is reminiscent of the way altarpieces were traditionally made. So it, it has a sort of a link to medieval art as well. But what are we actually looking at here? This is a story from the Bible, that is from the Catholic Bible and from most Orthodox Bibles, but it was not included in any of the Protestant Bibles. And the story is that of Judith and Holofernes. Now Judith was a young widow from the city of Bethulia. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but I'll give you the uh, correct spelling over here. And that city or town, it's, it's considered a town in the Bible, it's besieged by an enemy army that we usually assume to be Assyrians. And these Assyrians come in the name of Nebuchadnezzar. They are led by a general called Holofernes. The town itself will not stand this army. Everybody's going to be killed. That's pretty obvious to everyone in the town. And then Judith comes up with a plan. She discusses it with a number of the elders of the city and then proceeds to, to uh, execute it. What she does is she wears her most beautiful clothing. She takes up all kinds of jewelry that she has. She, she uses all kinds of expensive perfumes. Uh, she uses makeup to be as attractive as possible. Then she gets a maidservant, a slave. Together they, they gather food, and, and wine and all the things that she requires and they leave the city. In all outward appearances it seems as if she is going to betray her own city. She goes to the Assyrian guards, they stop her, ask her what she's doing and she explains that she wants to betray her city. She wants to be taken to Holofernes, the, the, the general, and she's going to tell him how he can take the city without losing any of his own men. When she's brought before him, he's immediately charmed by her because she's so very, very beautiful. And she tells him that the city is going to fall whenever the, the people in the city will start to sin against their god. And they are about to because they are running out of food and they're almost down to the last bits, which is the food that's reserved for the priests in Jerusalem. And they're not allowed to eat that. And she says that God has spoken to her and said that when they sin, he will not help them. And so they can be killed by Holofernes and his men. She then promises to spend time in the Assyrian camp. She will stay there and she will pray to God at night. And God will at some point tell her whenever that the sins have taken place. And that will be the green light for the attack. And for three days she stays in that camp, spends her nights praying outside the camp. And then on the fourth night, Holofernes invites her to a banquet in his tent. There, he drinks too much. When everyone else has left, he falls asleep. That is her cue. She then grabs his sword, cuts off his head, puts it in the bag that she has transported her food in, and she has her slave there as well. And together they leave the tent with this bag of food that they've been carrying around, except there's no food in it anymore. It's the head of Holofernes. They go back to their own city, and the next day, the head of Holofernes is displayed on the walls of the city. That scares the Assyrians so much that they flee, 
and, and so she's rescued the city. Now in art you see depictions of this story quite often. In, in versions like this one by, by Alori, that might actually be a, a portrait of someone. Um, it has been quite popular throughout history to be portrayed as Judith. Because what happens, what you do then is you pretty much say, my behavior might look as though it's sinful, but in reality, I'm helping everybody and I'm, I do it all for the glory of God. And that means you can basically behave whatever, in whatever way you want to and still claim to be without any form of sin. And what you have to have in a painting of Judith and Holofernes is, well, Judith, a beautiful young widow dressed in beautiful clothing, her servant, an elderly slave, you see her on the side here, and of course Holofernes' head, and she usually carries a sword. There's a sword there, um, and very often you see something of the bag that they're going to put his head into. Uh, this is one of the most famous versions. It's, it's the one by Caravaggio. He chose the moment of, of action and the most bloody and horrible moment in the entire story where she actually cuts off the head and you see Judith here cutting it off and she has trouble doing it and she you, you can see in her face that she really doesn't want to. Uh, she finds the whole business quite distasteful and her servant that is trying to really support her is trying to edge her on say go on go on do it uh, who's also by the way holding the bag that they're going to put the head into. But if we then compare it to the, the version by Klimt, it is quite different. It is a, a peculiar way to tell the story because there are some elements missing. For instance, there's no sword, there's no maidservant, there's no bag to put the head into. And in fact, you can hardly see the head. The head is, is sort of cropped out by the frame. And of course, she is completely unnecessarily nude because the story as it's told in the Bible, says that she just came in and he had fallen asleep because he was so drunk. Now, in many of the tellings outside the Bible, the story had become much more erotic. Many have interpreted the story as that she had seduced him, they had sex, he fell asleep, and that was the moment that she cut off his head. But that's not the biblical version. And in fact, so many of the, of the elements of the story are missing, that it's difficult to determine what story this actually is. That is why he, Klimt, very helpfully added the title of the painting on top, so we can be sure what we are seeing here. But one of the things about it is that she's much more erotic. I mean, look at her face. She's, by the way, the, the gold in this case serves very well as the biblical reference to, the, to all the jewelry that she's wearing and she has obvious makeup on. But she's, she's a femme fatale. She really seems to enjoy what she's just done. There's sort of a sexual gratification here. And that's pretty weird for the story. That's often been pointed out that there was a, a source that Klimt used for this painting. That is a painting that during his lifetime was very famous. It had been made, well, in the decade before. And that's this painting by Franz von Stuck. It's called The Sin or Die Sünde in, in German. It's not anyone in particular, it's a personification of sin. This nude lady with an enormous snake, which always sort of reminds me of someone who could be Voldemort's girlfriend. And if you look at this painting, several elements are very similar to, to Klimt's version. Of course, the nudity and that face that is sort of mysterious, but well, yes, sinful, I guess. And in this case, this is only part of the entire thing because here's the whole work. In this case, there's an entire frame around it that makes it almost as if it's a, a temple. And just as in Klimt's case, the, the title is on the frame as well. In this case, at the bottom. So it's pretty clear that Klimt used this as an inspiration for his work. But still, the, the attractive thing about it, I think, is that it's... This, this strange sort of departure from the norm of the way that Judith and Holofernes was usually painted. There's this, this weird eroticism. There's this, she seems so, well, happy about what she's done. And it makes the picture so incredibly intriguing. 
Now you should really see this one in the flesh, so to speak. You should see it live and it's pretty easy to see it because it's in the Upper Belvedere in Vienna, which is a wonderful museum for Austrian art. And there's a, a great selection of Klimt there and a lot of other really good paintings as well and sculptures and all kinds of things. So you should really go there. And it's not just a museum. The, the building itself is a, is a treat as well. It, it contains gardens and everything and it's it's a beautiful opulent palace and since you have to go to Vienna at least once in your lifetime as well it's really a matter of when and not why you should go there anyway I hope you enjoyed this video give me a thumbs up if you did if you haven't already then please subscribe to my channel and thank you very much for watching see you soon bye